really a great pleasure to be with you. Here, let me put up my... Great, does that look okay? Perfect. <clears throat> All right. Um, you know, field work is such a wonderful thing. Uh, you're on the ground floor of human behavior. Uh, you're exploring the complexities of life. You're recording things. Uh, you're getting sick. <laughs> Uh, you're having visa problems, whatever my year, you're learning new things, uh, you're socially exhausted. Um, field work is great. Um, it's even greater when you make the most of it by asking and answering questions the field might feel important, or at least you or I might feel important. In either case, um, I'm going to argue here in this talk that answering cultural evolutionary questions in the field is best done when we have a good relationship with theory. To do this, I'm going to discuss my own field work, but also uh, un among the Tongan people, but also highlight the work uh, by uh, other researchers such as uh, Katie Dems, Sarah Matthew, Susan Perry, uh, and their collaborators. Um, so yes, having a good dialogue is key, um, as well as having that dialogue with other sort of subfields. And, uh, if you just uh, indulge with me for a minute for this, uh, for a little sort of thought experiment, I think it's helpful to think of the field as interactive as possible. And see, so in front of you, you have this, this intergenerational crew pictured here. Uh, there's me there on, a, here on the upper right as the field worker. You can think of my mom as the theorist, my grandmother, you can think as the historian, and my son as the experiment, literally the experiment, right? And when I go out into the field, I'll collect data, even sometimes close to my mother's village. Uh, and after nearly 15 years in this anthropology business and going out into the field, uh, my mother, the theorist, still says, what the heck are you doing over there? <laughs> we left that village, you know, that small village for better opportunities in the US. What are you doing over there? And, and this is after 15 years of doing work over there, right? And so um, this is theory to field work. And now if the field worker or me says something seemingly wrong to theory or to my mom, she'll say, uh, remember your roots, right? Remember your roots. Uh, but then I'll say, mom, things have changed in your village. There's more roads, there's stores, there's cars uh, even. So you should really update your view of the village, right? And of course, there's history. My grandmother says, I saw this coming a mile away. And finally, my son will say, you know, can I go inside and play games now? <laughs> and so um, the conversations between theorists, I mean, uh, field workers, um, experimentalists, and historians are not exactly like this. I hope not, right? This is kind of a silly example. But there are similar interactions that are absolutely key to the field's development. And um, this is especially so as the field has diversified over the last few decades. And there's a lot more actors at play and even those in the field. So if you were to do, so a few days ago, I did a quick Google Scholar search and you can see the search terms I put in there. I, I put in a couple sort of theoretical foundation, you know, sort of foundational authors in there to help ground the search. And if you divide that search across decades, you'll see just a handful of articles having the word fieldwork in it related to the, to the field. And then over time, the 80s, 90s, and you know, the 2000s to the last decade, there has been a, a near exponential growth in papers or theses or what have you about fieldwork. Um, and Granted, not all these papers have are, uh, are empirical papers, some of them mention field work, but either way, there's a lot of interest in the application of this foundational theory in, uh, in the field. Um, and the question we should be asking ourselves, I think, are we still in the family? Meaning, are the theoretical insights from the 70s and 80s that in my mind have made it so exciting, the field so exciting, still, is there still a close relationship with the uh, papers we see out now that have an empirical or a sort of field um, uh, uh, angle to them. Um, I think that relationship should be fairly close. 
uh, in order to make the models better. Um, and now that the field has moved beyond the questions of does culture exist or does culture matter, and those are answered, and those earlier, earlier programmatic pieces in the sense that they show that socially learned beliefs and behaviors are evolutionary important across many different species. They can be maladaptive, they can be adaptive. Now at the point that those questions are sort of answered, uh, that we can now take these models and update them so that they're more easily translated to the field. That's kind of what we want, at least in my mind. And to do that, there needs to be an open dialogue between theory and with uh, empirical work and especially in the field. Okay. Um, maintaining that relationship can be hard, I think. It requires a constant work because there's constantly a barrage of more theoretical, theor theoretical papers out there. And empiricists and field workers have to maintain some kind of mental model of, of theory in order to operationalize them in the field. Right. And um, here's a silly example here where, hey, look at what parameter M migration globalization is doing to the world. Uh, this reflects it, self reflects it. So you can, <laughs> you can ask yourself, yeah, but look how N population size influences M scandalous, right? And given that, you know, we had some great talks recently about how, you know, the cognitive folks are saying how we should insert gossip so we can remember technical stuff. So there we go. If you insert the word scandalous every time there's something technical, maybe we'll remember it better. Right? But yes, um, there should be that dialogue about the interplay of different forces that are shaping the variation we see around us. And we can look at empirical or I mean, sort of ethnographic or field work we see sort of either be closely related to the models, and so you see the arrows there to more strongly related, for example, estimating the parameters of certain models, of theoretical models, or they can be weakly associated with this models, be inspired by it, or they may be looking at theoretical holes that the models don't uh, get at. Uh, there'll be other concerns, perhaps like the field, for example, Measurement is a huge deal. Trying to figure out how to measure things can be really difficult. And so that may uh, also have some sort of weak association with the models. But either way, there should be some relationship with that theory to help update the theory and help update sort of, you know, going back to our roots, I mean, uh, empirically, right? So I'm going to give you a few examples in the field, a couple from my own experiences and a few from others uh, where. I think that theory has really helped out, and I think there, the empirical work can help out theory. So a number of years ago, I was at a, um, in a particular village that I frequently go in, in the islands. And this is in the, Tongue, the Kingdom of Tonga, which is in the South Pacific. And uh, we were having dinner, and uh, my friend, she says, hey, there's, this, there's someone visiting from the main island. And she came to teach a number of women who are, who are weavers, right? Uh, often this is done for a living. This technique, a new technique on how to weave something. And she, uh, she named the technique and she named the item. Um, and she said that, yeah, this technique was lost a couple of generations right after European contact. You know, it was a chiefly item, but afterwards, you know, they stopped making it. They're in the museum. So the bottom right hand basket you see is something that's found in, in a museum in Germany. And um, there was an old tattered one that they had in one of the high schools in, on one of the main islands. And Lesieli you see pictured here on the right sort of in the foreground. Uh, she is teaching these women how to make this new basket. Anyway, so my friend was telling me, hey, there's this woman, she's coming in. And she's teaching these several, you know, these about 15 to 20 women how to do this new technique that was lost, you know, a couple of centuries ago. Um, she says, oh, would you be interested in hanging out and checking it out? And in my mind, so my gears started turning, you know, I have other things going on, perhaps maybe, you know, I have this cultural survey that I've been usually doing, I usually do. But after a little while, it occurred to me that this was maybe, I mean, a teacher coming, expert coming in, teaching novices, 
something new but was there before anyways the wheel started turning very very slowly and, and then i decided okay i gotta go check this out and so i went over to this meeting and there was uh you know 15 or 16 women there we were talking you know they were talking and we were discussing this new sort of weaving thing they were as we were as they were making these baskets they were there were people there that were already laying bids on the baskets they were making or uh, they were making right and so this was sort of you know this is a kind of a high profile event for them and in the end of uh, i was able to sort of log and take account of how fast and how well they were making these baskets across the different women and um the mental model that eventually over time took over it was the one that was uh, in one of Hendrix, Joe Hendrix's papers, 2004, that sort of, you know, made famously known for looking at the ethnography of Tasmania, but be used for all sorts of different things, was the idea that there's different skill or uh, knowledge levels gained from a teacher, right? And that variation matters. And the reason that variation matters is that if that there's any kind of demographic process where people are lost to the population in the Tongan Islands, people out migrate quite a bit. You know, they'll come to the U.S. just like my, you know, uh, parents did, and so, and so you lose that uh, expert, right, or you lose that person from the population, and so has an applied sort of revitalization, revitalization sort of of a field to this kind of work. But I use that model and fit my sort of weaving data to that model. And there's a paper that comes with it, but um, and estimate a couple of parameters from the model. There's, I couldn't estimate every parameter. And so you had to, so you have to sort of simulate along those unknowns. But I think it was because I had that mental model of this particular question and, you know, a little bit of that background, I was able to sort of capture on this particular sort of opportunistic um, a moment in the field and uh, a year later I came back and I visited a few of the women that were at that workshop and a, a couple of them had similar baskets but one or two had these amazing sort of variations they made off from that basket sort of weaving technique uh, you see pictured in the bottom right hand side there making something that goes around your waist something that goes on, around your neck specifically for her son as he was graduating school and so um, yeah uh, absolutely an example of where sort of someone just took something and sort of running away with this technique and creating new things, which is, of course, a, an, an important part of sort of uh, cultural evolutionary thought, you know, innovation. Um, and so that model helped me. Now, does field work look like this? Absolutely not. And I don't think it should <laughs> all the time, right? Um, uh, maybe just this once. It doesn't happen to me very often, but it is the case that Sometimes we're out in the field and there's so many opportunities to do so, so do so many different things. And if we have the mental models, at least the, of, of theory or the models, mathematical models themselves, then we can better make use of our time out there. Uh, most of my field work is planned out in more detail and I go out with a plan and, 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 and with uh, uh, lots of preparation. But situations like these, Right. Um, I think ethnographically we see lots of these right in their field work. People come across these these absolutely wonderful uh, uh, sort of vignettes, right, of what the world's like. And if we can capture that empirically, then um, I mean that's that's a big plus. Um, uh, in the times where I do plan things, uh, I'm we're able to make use of theory more explicitly, but however, it's, sometimes it's not always the case, it's obvious what can go on. So um, now contributing to, to mainstream science is awesome for me. Uh, if you're a part of, part of a cultural minority, then sometimes you ask yourself whether you're doing stuff that helps your minority community in any, in any way. Um, and so, I mean, most of the work, I, I try to tie to more applied aspects culturally. One of the more important preoccupations that many minority groups have is whether their culture will last. Right, and so we all know language shifts are, ha are happening around the world, and, and cultural sort of traditions are being lost because of globalization. Uh, and this preoccupation you see on the right-hand side here, um, imagine you sort of uh, going from you know shifting different environments, and, and the common one that I study is you go from a sort of subtropical place to 
shoveling snow in Utah, <laughs> right? Um, uh, Futahelu is, uh, you see pictured on the right-hand side, uh, it, uh, he, um, he was he's sort of a he was an important figure academically in sort of the Pacific Islander sort of uh, indigenous scholarship and uh, he went to uh, University of Sydney and studied in Australia after spending most of his life in uh, in the islands um, and he studied philosophy and mathematics and physics and when he came back to Tonga and started one of the first tertiary institutes in the in the islands um, he created this model, and this was in 1991, right, where he was like, okay, I think we can think about cultural change in terms of molecules and, you know, you know probably sort of a taking it straight from physics and faster rates of change and boundaries and pressures and all those sorts of things were important to him. Um, there wasn't a, an elaboration on this particular model since then. Um, however, it did, it did sort of have an impact on me uh, when I rediscovered his work late, uh, years after this. And uh, I would go and do field work where I look at cultural change. And so on the left-hand maps, you'll see sort of a mapping out of a village and a mapping out of an urban environment where I did my field work. And I really want to understand the idea of how to deal with cultural change, right? And in, especially in migrating populations. And it was hard for me to, to figure that out until I came across uh, this model by Kvalis, Force and Feldman in their book in 1981, that uh, it was a model about migration and assimilation, but it had certain terms on there. I thought they were fairly sort of key there. You had a diaspora contribution to, to cultural change uh, in, think of Utah, for example, uh, and you had a recent migrant contribution to cultural change for those who are coming from the island directly, and the flows, right, and the demographic flows matter, and um, whenever you do field work, you tend to divide things up in domains because, you know, you see that table in front of you, there's all these different cultural traits and they belong in different domains of behavior that may be different. So you can estimate these parameters from that model across these different domains. And it helped me organize my thinking, right? It helped me, it almost rescued, rescued the data in a sense that it grounded it to a quantitative procedure that was uh, relevant at the time. Um, um, to help me understand the forces shaping the cultural change or variation I see in the diaspora. Now, this is kind of a small niche sort of project, right? Uh, those who are interested in sort of demic migration. However, there has been a great, there's been great recent work on more broader questions in the field, um, such as cooperation. And so uh, the theoretical accounting behind cooperation, uh, specifically altruism, is sometimes framed as a group selective process where sufficiently different groups may experience different levels of spread or growth. Uh, the, in the inequality you see on your left hand side there summarizes the argument. Um, it has well known parameters such as the group benefit to an increase in the frequency of an altruistic trade um, and, and, then, and then the denominator. Uh, the, the cost to an individual for having an increase in altruistic disposition. Um, the right-hand side there are representing group differences, right? Selection has to work on variation, right? And so that's what that really means is um, FST is a measure of those group differences as the fraction of the total trait. Variation found between groups. And so the higher the value of this FST, uh, uh, the greater the differences between groups and the greater the scope for uh, cultural group selection. Uh, Carla Hanley and Sarah Matthews targeted this particular measure, FST, uh, and there would be a follow-up study from Sarah Matthews' earlier work in Monsu Turkana. And without going into too much detail, because you can check out their paper, uh, they showed, you know, they showed a substantial amount of Group, very, uh, group differences with that measure of FST uh, at different scales, you know, between clans, between different sort of ethnic, and even between different ethnic groups. And so, and they use, I mean, this, what's neat about this is that we were able to do it in far more detail, detail than other you know, previous work. Uh, as you see below there, there's some work on genetics and some work in other, on cultural FST from other work. They did in far more detail and they associated this measure with sort of 
probability of cooperating between groups, right? And um, what's neat here is that Carla and Zara use this model to assess a particular argument, primarily whether culture is the primary driver for the evolution of large scale cooperation, right? And so that assessment is made possible through a tie to that theory, right? To that inequality, if you say that. Um, I think that's I think that's really neat. Uh, the next two examples I'm going to go over um, are not so much about identifying or, or estimating parameters, at least not explicitly, uh, but they are sort of uh, using imp uh, theoretical insights to talk about holes in the theory or holes in our knowledge in a, in a fairly efficient way. And um, so, I'll. Part of cultural evolution is understanding pathways of transmission, I think. And some of the terminology um, that we often use comes from uh, Cavalli, Swartz, and Feldman, the vertical, oblique, horizontal transmission. Um, and uh, here's a table on the left, you see here on your left here, that describes the organization of a model about vertical and oblique transmission here. Um, a number of field workers have used this transmission pathway approach to explore certain scenarios. Uh, it helps us think about specific case studies as well as broader theories about human life history. And uh, uh, Catherine Demps, Katie Demps, she uh, used this theory to understand honey collection, right? So this is a foraging problem. And um, she interviewed individuals who uh, about honey collecting, uh, the knowledge about honey collecting, uh, and her survey, ethnographic survey was meant to design to assess a variety of types of knowledge regarding bees and honey. Uh, she asked at what age the informant first learned a skill associated with honey collection, at what age they mastered the skill, how they learned it, and from whom they learned it. Um, those are all key questions because they are looking to uh, sort of illuminate that pathway by which this knowledge is passed down, right? Um, and definitely am I sort of inspired by this sort of transmission pathway approach that was, uh, was well known for sort of Cavalli, Swartz, and Feldman sort of work. Um, so Katie, Katie and colleagues show that the variability in how individuals acquire different knowledge and, and skills um, uh, was quite high across their life. Uh, and so here on your right hand side, you see this figure, this uh, you know colorful figure, where if you look at the top sort of numbers, of the top number ranges there, you have 69, 10 to 15. Those are all ages, right? And so, and the wider the the columns there, you see the more uh, of the um, the skill is acquired at that age. And so tree climbing, you learn when you're young, um, and uh, when you're older, uh, less so. Uh, Another technique using the smoky torch, uh, it's more spread out, but a lot of adolescents for 10 to 15 are getting it. Uh, cutting uh, honeycomb, you have 10 to 15, 15, 20 is a little later in life, uh, the honey song a little early in life. So what's neat about this is that Kitty is sort of showing the pathways of learning or skill development for these different techniques when collecting honey. The colors there are about, uh, from whom, right? From whom does this knowledge come from? And if you look at the greens, then that's about father. If you look at the blues, about brother. Uh, light blue is about elder kin. Uh, friend is in the purple and others. And you can see that all across those different techniques, sort of those different domains of honey collection, that there's quite a bit of variability. Father seems to be present for uh, a good, you know, three fourths of these things. Uh, brother's not there, <laughs> maybe just a couple times, but definitely elder kin and friends for tree climbing are there. And so this is really neat because it, it for any particular case, we're interested in that, that sort of knowledge acquisition. Um, and while not there explicitly in the models, right? And this is what is the crux of their, sort of their work that of, of Katie's and, uh, and work is that they're trying to show that we should pay attention to sort of age dependent transmission pathways. I've quoted here a part of their paper. We infer age dependent transmission pathways at different stages in the life cycle. And that's neat. And I think that theory can be honed in on that. And as we uh, look to more uh, uh, direct field applications. Okay. 
Um, so Kate and colleagues used the transmission models as a jumping off point to more complex considerations. Uh, as we'll see next with capuchin monkeys, it is easy for field workers to divide the cultural world into domain specific considerations, just like here, and also move beyond the models. And so um, a uh, great study here with you know, uh, Susan Perry, Brenda Barrett, and Irene Godoy, uh, 10 year longitudinal, you know, 10 years of data there uh, of Capuchins. Uh, and, uh, and what's neat here is that it's only longitudinal field data can get at the stuff they really got out here, right? Uh, innovation is a temporal process, right? We can think of it as a temporal process. and. Uh, by using 10 years, 10 groups, 234 wild capuchin monkeys, uh, they were able to ask questions about innovation that we could not, that we have not been able to, I think, in a sort of non human primate. And so, uh, like most field workers, we tend to divide stuff up into different domains, and they did the same foraging, self directed behaviors, social and investigative categories of uh, behaviors that they could investigate uh, their innovations in. Of, they have a cool video at, with their paper about a capuchin dipping their tail in a tree to access water. I think that's super cool and uh, obviously sort of, sort of relevant to adaptive matters. Um, uh, part of their motivation for this is not just looking at theory, but this sort of methodological thing. How do you get at these questions, right? And what are uh, you know statistical and sort of empirical ways? methodological ways of getting at these questions here. Um, and so you know, the bullets on the left-hand side sort of give a sort of summary of some of the story there about how many innovations, you know, how ephemeral some of them were, how, you know, whether they were shared at all um, and their distribution across the different categories. Uh, what was super neat is that they were able to, uh, uh, through some sort of statistical accounting, figure out how, which model so which individual characteristics were able to predict that innovation? And so you can see, uh, I'm gonna show a couple of figures here. Here's log age on the right-hand side, and see if we have innovation rate. I think that's per year, um, that's estimated. And as you get older, well, when you're younger, you tend to be more investigative, as, at least in that particular category, which is manipulating objects, right? Whether they be animate or inanimate objects, um, uh, foraging, and you see the effect of the social. I mean, uh, the scale here is kind of throwing off, but if you were to zoom in here, there are sort of important sort of side effects of age for, for the other categories too. Um, uh, their statistical sort of uh, model comparison suggests that age and sociality were probably the best, right? Because there were other things involved, like rank, right, in the in the group uh, that didn't come out. Um, older individuals in general were slightly more innovative. And that was kind of the uh, sort of one of the main parts of their story here. We also see that, you know, they had sociality scores that were, you know, that, uh, that also were used to help predict, uh, that came out as part of the top models to help predict innovation rates and social sociality helped predict a number of different things, uh, social innovations, for example. Um, uh, and so less social individuals had higher innovation rates in, the, in other domains like foraging, investigative and self-directed. Uh, those, these effects were sort of more weaker and less certain. And so I think, I mean, this is particularly a neat study uh, in that they, I mean, it comes from that tradition and cultural religion about sort of transmission and innovation, right? And uh, uh, especially since one of the earliest works uh, by sort of uh, Ben Richardson were in part inspired by the diffusion of innovations literature and how that goes, and and taking that and saying, okay, let's break it down more. Let's see what the model should be doing now with with the empirical world, right? And um, and giving that feedback, right? Keeping it within the family, right? As I, I stay with that for example, um, and. I really think that dialogue is super important. And so, uh, you know, I'm revisiting the slide again. Uh, with a, uh, an additional thing on the bottom here is that 
the earlier cultural evolution models were often built with a different purpose. Let me just point this out. And so when you read some of those earlier papers, like, yeah, we're here to show that culture matters, right? We're here to show, to check basic arguments that you can have adaptive culture, you can have a maladaptive culture, you could have sort of group selection happening, right? Uh, and they weren't necessarily built, while well, you could use them, were necessarily built for direct testing in the field, being predictive in specific environments. Um, not some of them are, but not all of them. Um, but now we have we're at an opportunity with that explosion, right, of uh, field work to make great create that feedback. To, okay, there's this great model on ethnic markers, a great model about cooperation or things. Um, it's it's great for general argument's sake, but what is it going to help with a particular field scenario? And uh, you know, science works with big broad proclamations, but also through minuscule sort of case studies and then testing those things. Um, and so we should all, you know, as empiricists, yeah, what roots, you know, are we paying attention to the roots of the field, for example, to have good mental models of moving, you know, that we take with us out into the field and help us make the most out of field work. Um, uh, I think that's super key. And do the theorists pay attention to the empirical things, which is, you know, what Katie Dentz is showing of sort of over the life course, how transmission happens, or are we paying attention to, like what Susan Perry and others did, with you know looking at rank and other uh, or the or age or things that are also important there. Um, having that dialogue super important because we need more models, right? We need more models about you know fieldwork specific things, and we need more fieldwork, right? And fieldwork, of course, takes a little longer and um, has diff has diff different challenges, and models do too on their end. Um, so with this end, I, um, I'm interested in theory for that purpose. And so I built an introductory model, module for this, for the purpose of understanding these, having that dialogue with models. And so I called it Foundations of the Cultural Evolution because I thought these questions were kind of foundational, right, to cultural evolution. Um, they're definitely not all the foundational models, but they are some of them. Uh, if I were to have sort of a subtitle, it would be a dialogue with models particularly because um, I try to make it as interactive as possible. And so, uh, whoops, I'm not thanking you just yet. Um, uh, for example, I have one module here where you can, uh, there's this fairly well-known paradox uh, named after Alan Rogers. <laughs> there's, a, there's an exchange in the, early, in the 90s about, you know, the, uh, when social learning should arise and, you know, what that does to, you know, average fitness in the population. And so this goes at that particular question. And let me see if I can get this to play. Play, nope, it didn't, hold on. Okay, so you can change, you know, cost, you know, to individual learning and it'll change the ESS or the evolution stable strategy of social learners. If there's no cost individual learning, you should only be learning learning on your own, but if it is costly, then you can see that ESS frequency of social learners increasing. If you shift it, you know, environmental changes, meaning that, you know, uh, conventional wisdom is not holding up, then, you know, then individual learning is definitely dominant. If there's no environmental change, conventional wisdom should keep you going, right? So there should be very few individual learners. And so this is kind of a sort of a basic um, yeah, insight, I mean, uh, you know, decades old, but, but super important, I think. If you change resource benefit, nothing happens. <laughs> so trying to teach about, you know, relative fitness, and we're not talking about absolute fitness here. So uh, here's another one. This one is about uh, uh, the prevalence, uh, you know, why should we adapt traits because of, you know, whether they're high, high frequency or not in the population. Uh, it's a bit more complex because this is talking, this is more dynamic, meaning that it says, okay, over time, do, should we see more conformity or less conformity or more individual learning, more individual learning, depending on sort of rates of environmental change. Uh, as the environment shifts, then nobody knows what's going on until you have individual, learner, individual learners coming in and innovating. And so, uh, if I okay, let's run this. There, there I am. So, if you increase environment, you know, more environmental change, there's shifts there, right? You introduce a little bit more orange, which is the individual learner, whereas blue is the conformist, right? And so, you get more environmental change happening. Uh, you get more individual learning happening. Right, uh, but if you decrease that, then you'll get more blues or more conformity because conventional wisdom is still working out for you. Uh, if you change the cost to R&D, research and development, 
uh, as an individual learner, then that also, sh you know, uh, will affect uh, whether you have conformance or individual learners there. Okay. So uh, these are all come from real sort of basic models that if that sort of hopefully can be internalized by the field worker because. Um, right now, there's a lot of environmental change. You know, when I think about migration, which is why I primarily study, um, there's all sorts of shifts going on. You know, people are changing different sort of physical, environmental, social environments, and the way they deal with that, right, uh, is you know, adapting, right, uh, conforming, or 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 maybe even coordinating on ethnic markers, and so those are all important questions to me, at least, and knowing this sort of this temporal process, I think, is super super key to uh, to empirical application. Um, here's one last one I'd like to show you how do innovation spread. And so here, uh, this is you know your classic innovations curve here, except that I include conformity, which means that if the frequency of A goes over 0.5, then you know then you have an effect of conformance. Saying okay, there's lots of people doing it, so maybe I should adopt too. And so this is the interplay between payoff bias learning, meaning you adopt those with, you know, you adopt behaviors that appear to be doing well for others, uh, or just adopting what a lot of people are doing. And so um, same idea here is you have, you know, if you change the amount of time conformity is used, then it's more of a diffusion of innovations process by payoff bias learning. But if you have a little bit of conformity, what conformity does kind of draws out that time because and if, you, if there's too many conformists and nobody adopts anything, right? Because the innovation, by definition, is rare in the first place, right? And so there's that interaction between uh, being an innovator and, of course, being conformist. And so uh, I think that dialogue, I think this dialogue hopefully is sort of in our minds a little bit. I think it is for most of you know, most of those who are sort of familiar with the with the with the theory. But um, I'm guessing as the field expands and there's more field workers out there and there's only so much you know, time you can have with you know, dedicating to learning theory versus you know, the hard difficulty things of coming with that comes with doing field work, that sometimes we may uh, know more of one or the other and maybe not have as strong of a mental model of theory as we should have when we go out into the field. Anyways, so, uh, that's all I have for my presentation. So I think I'll just do Q and A right now. Sergey, we're having an issue with your audio. Yes, yes, you're right. So, so, so sorry about that. I got to push the button. Um, can you say something or reflect on how uh, cultural, cultural evolution outlook sits with the broader anthropology community, its values and traditions? Um, so if I understand the question right, um, I mean, anthropology is, I, if, we're, if we're talking about broader anthropology, is definitely a very varied field. Um, and some of the field work is about lived experience, right? And so uh, where maybe uh, more qualitative descriptions of experience are, are what's, what people really want to understand. Um, uh, if, if that's the case, I think it can still be tied to uh, cultural evolution, at least in the field, uh, I mean, in, in th uh, theoretically, because, uh, I mean, it all ties together, right? If there's uh, if there's expressions about uh, of they're looking at you know the expression of signaling or ethnic markers or understanding about conformity, uh, those are all lived experiences. People do sort of uh, have um, express those very explicitly, right? And so uh, at least that part of anthropology, you know, that thick description that sometimes is used to describe that part of anthropology. Uh, I think that's really key. So other parts, I mean, I mean, there's so many different areas here. We could talk about biological or physical, and, and all those we can probably put our or in, or put our, you know, put some effort in to understand uh, how social social learning operates. Um, I'm not sure if I'm getting at your question right, but um, uh, but uh, I, 
but I think what's key here is making sure we're, we're sort of grounded in some of, those, some of those original insights to make those uh, sort of to this to um, uh, to get at those descriptions. Yeah. Well, I, I think I, I think that question was more related to something like do people say in social anthropology care much about uh, cultural evolution in the oh yeah <laughs> use that. Yeah, you know what? I mean, I mean, there are these. I mean, culture. There's these old cultural evolutions, right? And so, cultural evolution is not, you know, specific to the, you know, 70s and 80s. Rather, it was really old term was associated with other individuals. And so, um, maybe social anthropology is more familiar with those particular traditions. And of uh, uh, social anthropology, in a way, gets at this because they have their own debates within social anthropology about the role of culture and the role of individual agency. And so. Um, uh, there, there's definitely a institutional barrier there, uh, but uh, social anthropology has those similar debates, right? Uh, I mean, even in, I mean, in evolutionary anthropology, we sometimes people focus on individual level decision making and don't care for much for culture, and uh, others really focus on culture. And in social anthropology, you have those who focus on agency and don't think the culture concept is really interesting. Uh, and that debate is happening in social anthropology, as happening in in evolutionary anthropology, and so. Uh, I think we can point that out, uh, and uh, I think we can use bridges that way by showing that we're having similar discussions across the board. Thanks. Uh, the next one is, how does transmission explain the creation of innovations in the first place? All right, and this might be getting at this. Um, uh, this might be getting at this broader question about, you know, we can think of innovation as being an individual level process, uh, or we can say it's influenced by, by, um, uh, uh, by social learning, right? That combination, and that that's that's an older question. So if I could, if I back up a little bit here, and uh, part of this paradox, you know, when it was talking about innovation, I think, and we think, we think of innovations as perhaps increasing the adaptive sort of of uh, the the mean fitness of a population, right? And uh, if we innovate and um, uh, but then others copy and that really doesn't change much for the whole population, perhaps it's not working at all for us. But uh, I think what when when uh, Boyd and Richardson responded to with help and others actually uh, sort of took on Roger's paradox and showed that if you combine learning with innovation, then it can, then it can, uh, individual learning, then you can get larger amounts of innovation than you could with, you know, with one of, be on their own. And so, in ha you know, ethnographically, we do know that people, when they innovate, they can be supported by the group. Uh, they'll learn from others. Uh, there's this paper I wrote a few years ago about group learning and how group learning and, and especially on difficult problems could really help uh, innovate at higher levels. Uh, this has been great work, experimental work about how group learning could help reach the higher adaptive peak. And so um, uh, the, they two, the two go hand in hand and they're isolated only for theoretical reasons, but definitely they go, they are in the real world, they're all together, right? All sort of bunched together, both individual and social sort of learning there. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, the next one is, uh, do models and I guess data support the classic saying that uh, necessity is the mother of invention, but it is uh, that individuals are more innovative in times of crisis. <laughs> um, that's an interesting question. I'm not sure if I, uh, I might need more background for that particular question, but I should say that there's, um, I say sometimes, right? Because it, um, empirically, we see lots of you know, innovations coming from happenstance, and uh, I think this has been documented quite widely by others who've written more about it and know more about it than I do. But um, uh, there are innovations that happen uh, that, are, that, are, that are accidental, and uh, there are cultural innovations that happen accidental. I've witnessed to those out in the field too, where if individuals they come across. Uh, uh, they come across something not because they were not because they were um, uh, sort of forced to or made to, but they saw opportunities out there, right? And 
uh, they were able to build on those opportunities. Uh, so it wasn't necessarily a push to invent something, but definitely this, you know, with our propensity to innovate and learn uh, from others, uh, there may be some, you know, baseline amount of, of innovation we do anyway that without any kind of necessity, you know, uh, uh, necessity being involved. Uh, there's definitely lots of social processes or cultural processes that could help us be better innovators. Uh, when I when I when I talk about uh, sailing across the Pacific, so I teach about the archaeology of you know of the first seafarers in the Pacific. Um, one of the biggest arguments was at least before was that demography might be pushing people along, right, from island to island. But as you look at the data, they're moving so fast, it can't possibly be any kind of population pressure pushing them along. They're just moving along, you know, from island to island and innovating on their canoes, uh, their outrigger canoes or, or double hole canoes in a way that has little to do with, with whether it's necessary to move, but rather, uh, you know, perhaps there being a culture behind, behind that movement, sort of a culture of navigators, a culture of, of seafarers. And so uh, you can get that innovation, I think, without, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not necessary. It is sufficient, though. <laughs> um, in a sense, any culture requires conformity if there is going to be any stability. But too much conformity fossilizes a culture, so it will not be able to respond to new environmental conditions. Can you say something about cultural elements that encourage or at least allow for innovation? For example, trickster legends. Yeah, I mean, uh, not in, not entirely in my wheelhouse, but I do know that people have been working on how you can divide up populations and have people work on sort of more uh, uh, solutions uh, in a sort of more efficient manner. Uh, uh, conformity is sort of an interesting beast uh, because, you know, the early psychological experiments sort of, you know, when you put people in a room and you have others sort of try to persuade others, there's a lot of social elements involved there, right? And so there's a lot of social marking, sort of uh, uh, signaling to others when it comes to conformity. Um, uh, but those could be sensitive to, they might be sensitive to a, a newcomer who comes in and sort of shows something different. And uh, I mean, there's just, and a lot of work has been done on, um, uh, on sort of group learning and and how uh, if you structure, if the, if the populations are structured in a certain way, if the groups are structured or, or, or the networks, if we use that term, uh, social networks are structured in a certain way, then uh, you can sort of break out this cycle of conformity or, or this sort of maladaptive peak, because that that's what we're thinking about, uh, and move to another one. Um, uh, now, of, of my colleagues could probably think of a number of different sort of ethnographic examples, and the ones that I, could, I, mean, I definitely think of are uh, uh, on the ground. Is about for me, anyways, as a field worker, is like climate change. With sea levels rising, I attend these meetings in the islands. We're like, how do we deal with this, right? Uh, do, you know, do we build a seawall? Do we do this? What are people saying? And uh, and there's definitely an element, um, sometimes an age structured element, as you can imagine, that is. Of making decisions, right? Um, that could prevent adoption of certain things. And so those group things matter. And I think cultural evolution has been able to show theoretically that it's possible. But the details, right? The devil is in the details. Who's there? Who, who what ages are there? Who's contributing? Right. And uh, the work by Katie Dempsey, I think, is really sort of illuminating uh, on uh, uh, on those transmission pathways, illuminating how that might, you know, how conformity innovations sort of are related. Thanks. In, in terms of data collection in the field, what do you think are some of the biggest challenges for someone interested in understanding cultural change from an evolutionary perspective? Do you have any advice for future field workers on overcoming these challenges? Um, Sergey, could you repeat the question, please? Sorry, it's breaking up a little bit. Oh, yeah. in, in terms of data collection in the field, what are the biggest uh, challenges uh, for people who are interested in cultural change from evolutionary perspective? And do you have any advice on how to overcome these challenges? Well, so, the, so the evolutionary sort of approach is always sort of this population thinking idea, right? This has been early on. And uh, getting 
uh, population measures can be difficult. And a lot of anthropologists do this anyway. But uh, sampling and learning how to sample in an effective way is, is, is really difficult. And uh, probably the biggest, one of the biggest challenges in cultural evolution is trying to figure out how people learn things, right? And uh, you saw Katie sort of getting at it with sort of honey, and these are all self-reports, right? But can you observe right, the transmission of ideas and, or the transmission of a particular sort of, uh, of, of behavior? And um, there's been lots of ideas, but implementing them has been, has been a little bit difficult. Um, uh, so understanding transmission sort of because this is sort of the cognitive part of that, and it has to be shared with the ethnographic sort of observational part with that, uh, requires sort of a, a multiple sort of multiple uh, prongs to get at that answer. And I think that's the difficult part with, however, it can be super easy too, because uh, cultural change happens so quickly that you can get at variation uh, 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 quite quickly too, and, and you know whether it's spatial variation, uh, linguistics have been really good at this, right? Just looking at phonetic, either phonetic or syntactic variation uh, across you know space and time, and so um, you know, I think I mean the greatest I mean the greatest challenge is getting at is getting at that population thinking idea and and sampling in a way that you can make broader inferences. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, there is another one. Um, can you say anything about the connection between this field work approach and new technological methods uh, used in uh, social sciences, for example, uh, like mechanical Turk experiments? Are there any people who use both or the mixture of these approaches? And is it for possible, for example, to estimate parameters in models using one method and then uh, evaluate the model results uh, from using the data from a different uh, set of methods? Right, so I think the concern from that question is may, um, how do we translate, you know, inferences from different populations? And um, I haven't used mechanical trick. I know some people do, and some people use it as a starting point to test an idea, especially if you're doing experimental games, which is easily administered. Um, surveys too can be. Um, uh, uh, I mean, this is the sampling. I mean, this is, you know, for a young, for a young empirical field, I mean, I mean, the early theory was definitely based on a lot of empirical work. Uh, but for those who are coming with these new questions about cultural transmission, a lot of these empirical concerns haven't been worked out yet. And so I think using MTurk, and I think it's great. Um, I haven't used it, uh, but I think we should be very modest when it comes to its interpretation because you know it is a slice, a certain slice of a population, and we're definitely interested in and between group cultural variation, which there could be a lot of. And so I know, I know uh, Joe Henrik has made and others have been made making this, you know, talking about the weird problem. So it's important that we understand our sampling as best we can before we sort of make more general inferences. And I think that variation should be maybe be the focus anyway and not head to sort of more general statements. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um... There is another one. Um, does modeling driven questions uh, do modeling driven questions uh, are modeling driven <laughs> modeling driven questions in danger of leading to a neglect of social institutions? If not, how can they be handled appropriately? Uh, if I understand correctly, the question is about this: if does our modeling should our modeling engage more in in looking at social institutions? Uh, I guess uh, uh, at least the models that you discussed uh, and most people use, they uh, neglect social institutions. Yeah, right. Yeah, the scale is really important here. And so sometimes, um, I mean, uh, Carla and Sarah, uh, Car Carla Handley and Sarah Matthew with their discussion of, I mean, um, of group, uh, cultural group selection are about essentially institutions, right, of at least ethnic, ethnic linguistic groups and perhaps the ways they go about uh, doing, you know, solving uh, cooperative dilemmas. Um, and so we can count that too. Uh, however, uh, a lot of these transmissions, it is true that these, a lot of these transmission 
processes are embedded within cultural institutions and they can be recognized, right? And so we could recognize that we have, you know, empirically groups of people that, you know, that have different transmission pathways. And so it's at different scales, I think. And so you could say, all right, within a certain group, this is how transmission is. And then another group, this is how transmission is. If, you know, if exogamy or is different or, or other sort of social norms are different. And I think they, I mean, I think they're completely compatible. You just have to make sure you're explicit about the scale of that you're uh, that you're trying to work on. I, institutions are definitely uh, uh, key here, and you could think of it as being exogenous. I think maybe that's the point: is that why they are endogenized? I mean, they're part of the model. Um, I think simplicity is the reason why we try to keep things fairly simple and just work on a couple of parameters at a time. But I, yeah, uh, so definitely institutions are key. We're just um, uh, you know that's um, but for yeah but right for many of these models it's just it's considered an external factor and uh, we we'll have to look at differences across different institutions right thank you um, we have several panelists here with our speakers in this series I wonder if uh, they have any comments or questions that they can ask uh, directly. No? Okay. Uh, well, I guess that's all. Uh, you've answered all questions. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to everybody. And uh, I hope uh, we will see you next week. <laughs>